Good evening. Um, I'm really pleased to present our uh, last guest speaker of the season. And um, as one of the uh, four founding partners of the multinational group Circle, David Erdman belongs to a new generation of architects who broke the boundaries of traditional practice by exploiting the network as a new modality for design collaboration. From Stockholm to New York, from Zurich to LA, they have established a reputation for innovative work which often cross the line between materials research, interactive electronics, and formal explorations. Equally comfortable with speculative projects and experimental prototype, David exemplified a new breed of practice in which theory and production coexist, resulting in projects which explore frontiers of fabrication and function, yet never stray far from coherent and often provocative propositions. Exhibition of their work at the Venice and Korean Architecture Biennale and at the Centre Pompidou as well as numerous publications attest to the vitality of their work, which, while modest in scale sometimes, is never lacking for ideas or meaning in the larger context. This was especially true of Urban's multimedia installation a few years ago at the Santa Monica Museum of Art, which stretched the limits of material expression and video projection with a fully integrated optical projection system and a fully realized one-off fiberglass structure with sail overhead like a plastic sci-fi octopus. David spent a year as a fellow at the American Academy in Rome, so now we are co-fellows. And I imagine that it's there that he may hone his preference for synthetic materials amid stone antiquities. And I wonder how much effect and how deeply this transplanted architect has been able to put down his roots. Recently, David formed David Clover. It's a new partnership with his also previous um, wife, Clover Lee. These two architects have a very special relationship with me. First, I got to know Clover because she came to our office. And I very rarely talk about that because I think that it always seems like you know, you're talking down. But to me, Chloe is a very, very special person. Uh, is a good friend, talented, dynamic, rapid. It's mighty, I call it mighty Chloe. Mm -hmm. And Craig, my partner, who Talk with David at UCLA very often we bring home stories of the different projects that David has initiated. So we have been following the adventures for some years. And this latest adventure established establishing the new office in Hong Kong, creating linkage to manufacturers and a network of design entrepreneurs mark their commitment to building which is a real challenge in these economic times. But I think that both David and Clover have never lacked courage, and I can't wait to see the latest work tonight. So please welcome David Burton. Am I, uh, wow, I'm definitely mic'd. Um, is that too loud? 
Meng, thank you so much. That was a wonderful um, personal introduction. Um, it's awesome to be back in LA um, amongst familiar faces and friends, uh, to be back in the weather. It's quite a bit different than, than Hong Kong, which is either hot or cold. Um, we've been there exactly one year, almost to the day, um, because of our stint in Rome. We had a little lag time after we left here. Um, and if nothing else, I think it's exposed us to the, the kind of speed, the really fast, cheap, somewhat uh, out of control culture of Southeast Asia and mainland China, um, which has been uh, kind of simultaneously the strangest thing I've ever experienced and probably the most exciting thing um, working over there. I'm going to try uh, to weave a, a kind of light conceptual thread tonight um, that at least Clover and I find in our work around this term, the mass, which is, um, for us, it's, it's really a play on the terms meaning. Um, uh, it's not just the act of collecting uh, and organizing particles into something larger, but it's, we use it as a play on its singularity and its plurality. Um, whether it's a verb or a noun, um, in a similar way to the way um, Gertrude Stein uses the rose, you know, a mass is a mass, a rose is a rose. I'm sure you guys uh, get it. Um, maybe this will advance. This might have been sitting here too long. Um, probably in no other audience could I point this out more, more astutely than this audience, but uh, Clover and I are different, as Ming pointed out. Um, we have different backgrounds and different approaches to things. And this, is, this, is, this variety of interest is something we really wear on our sleeves. We see it as a strength in our practice um, and in how we work. So we don't really try to blend these things out at all. We try to use those differences together in terms of how we come together as a collaboration. And a mass is really one way in which I suppose you can bring an umbrella over two ideas that I'm gonna to try to talk a little bit about tonight, which is how we think about mass production um, and mass media. Both of these terms have a common set of associations we may all find with them in our own individual way. Um, but Clover and I feel that they're a bit more deeply examined. There are some questions that come out of them that are relevant to um, contemporary practice. For instance, can mass that which is about weight uh, and permanence, uh, should it be something that's sped up? Can it be sped up? The, the urge in general to work in modes of mass production comes from this, the idea that you can speed up the production of architecture. But seems like only understanding that as a technical endeavor is somewhat short-sighted. Um, so we have, are asking questions like, are there perceptual or somatic ways that you can understand different speeds of mass? Um, or can media, which is, uh, to our mind, something which is substantially more prevalent in contemporary culture, um, definitely about the ephemeral and the immediate, um, is it something that can be slowed down? or um, can it be something slowed down to the point that architecture can become media or that you can mass it? These are the sorts of things that kind of influence how Clover and I work. Um, and then I'll talk about a bit. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive, but I'll try to kind of string them through the lecture a little bit tonight. Um, mass production then in our work is not solely the, the development of numerous standardized parts. Um, of course, we use a lot of the same equipment. As Ming mentioned, we have a fair amount of experience um, working with various fabrication methods. But for Clover and I, mass production is a series of, um, of combined methods that we are currently, and I think quite deeply involved with, that explore new configurations of mass. Um, so this rests on the laurels of um, some of the traditional ways we as architects, at least Clover and I, understand mass, which is to say it has something to do with joining surfaces, has something to do with emphasizing corners or the seam, um, and, it, and it has a, a kind of willingness to embrace or accept varying degrees of contrast 
um, and boundaries. But what we're trying to do is kind of play with those or explore ways in which they might shift or vibrate a little. Um, this, in part, I think, has to do with recognizing and trying to accept that a lot of the projects that we're currently getting in our office um, have little, if any, internal similarities, self-similarities. Um, so the programs are quite often very contrasting, the needs are very diverse, um, and so we're being asked to make sense of something that otherwise doesn't make sense together. How do two things which don't belong together go together? And we've started trying to develop some representational and modeling techniques that deal with um, uh, having an aptitude about how you might um, uh, not resolve those differences, but get them in very close proximity to one another. Uh, in other words, it's not about them transforming in a continuous way. We, we're trying to explore ways that they become a bit more cohesive, or kind of inlay in, inside of one another. Uh, it's really an interest of the misfits, or places where mass becomes a little bit less stable. Um, and it's drawn us to some specific architectural moments, and I will try to point some of these out tonight in the lecture, um, that result from things being in close proximity to one another that don't fit, like the squinch. This is something we have looked at quite a bit in teaching at UCLA in another context, and it is a kind of Dr. Seuss-like sounding architectural element that results from a half sphere and a cube not uh, being able to resolve or make sense of one another. Um, Similarly, uh, we have an interest in both visible and invisible uh, notions of mass and geometry. And our interest in minimal surfaces, like the Schwartz minimal surfaces, is not so much about the resultant surface, um, it is also about its relationship to the bounding box uh, around it. And it's the interaction between these two, the sleeving of one inside of the other, the possibility for both of them to be materialized at once, that, uh, that interests us. I think, and I spoke about this in Hernan's class today, we talked about this a bit with some of the, some students who may be in the audience, but I, I think, I really believe that the affect of mass is very difficult to diagram. Um, it's even difficult to predict or suggest that it's something that can be designed, but, but I do feel it's something that should be deeply studied, and this is a big reason why why I went to Rome was for Clover and I to spend, spend more time in some buildings looking at some of these attributes. Um, and I'll be stringing a series of pictures from that study through the lecture tonight, um, not so much to substantiate historical precedent. Um, you know, I think in many ways we were misreading these buildings through our computer latent contemporary eyes, and we intentionally span hundreds of years of, of work, so it's not a historical substantiation, but it's more to suggest that, that through being around um, some of these spaces and um, noticing certain aspects of mass, that there are other possibilities in contemporary media uh, in terms of how one might work. And there was a, there's a particular term that we were studying there that I, I think is very important in relationship to our work, um, which is a term that our exhibition here is titled after, which is the term immuring. Um, it is a term that can be used for just kind of entombing something in a wall, but for us it's the particular way in which Heinrich Wolflin um, used it to describe uh, the tension between columns and walls precisely at the zone when they are no longer freestanding columns, nor are they graphic pilasters, but they vibrate um, uh, somewhere in between. And I think what, what Clover and I find fascinating about this is it, it suggests that uh, mass on mass is a way that you would get mass to vibrate a bit versus mass and void. There's a kind of, you, have, you need more mass in order to play with this. It also suggests that you can work with things that are smooth and coarse at the same time. Um, sorry, that you can uh, look at the way two-dimensional elevations might begin to gather into something more three-dimensional, or the way that lines might begin to compress themselves into a mass. Some of the earlier exhibitions I designed with Servo um, that Ming was, was talking about, this is one for Nike, 
um, placed emphasis on mass production, certainly not only in the, in the modes of fabrication that we were using, but also in 2020 hindsight, for me at least, out of that group, I'm not sure if Marcelin would agree with this, who's in the audience today, um, it has, has to do with the way columns and ceilings and floors uh, interact. Um, these were probably the least continuous moments um, in our work, and to me they're, they're some of the most interesting, um, where we have to kind of sleeve things through one another. And I think there was a willingness to explore other possibilities of detaching things, or looking at coarser mixtures of material as they move across one another and shift in axes. And I think some of that sensibility persists uh, or is even heightened, I would suggest, in the work that Clover and I um, have been doing. If nothing else, there is definitely a willingness to work with the coarse, um, uh, to work with coarse and smooth at the same time, opaque or uh, mesh. And I call this, we kind of have a joke in the office that this is basically a way to avoid the void, um, which is to say that instead of it being mass and void, there's just different forms of mass, different gradients of materiality that can be explored within them. Um, one of the first projects that Clover and I really had an opportunity to explore this in, and it was really the kind of first official project of our office, um, uh, is this competition that we did for uh, housing project Paris and Beijing. And this is where we started looking at how you could inlay one kind of mass um, into another. Uh, and I guess, you know, to some extent it, it made sense because of the program. There has to be a studio and galleries and other things in, involved in this, but on the other hand it makes no sense at all because you could do that within a singular massing strategy. So we kind of, you know, intentionally pushed it into it to experiment with this. It also had opportunities to look at other scales of mass production, which at least Clover had looked at, but I hadn't looked at so much before, um, which had to do with the, the module of this housing unit was absolutely not um, negotiable. You had to use the same module. And so the idea of how that module could build up or produce other kinds of mass as you would aggregate it was a big part of what we were doing with this project. Um, it's located, it's Greater Bay, GBD, Greater Beijing Arts District, which is right outside the CBD, which is where CCTV is. This is a very uh, Chinese kind of branding thing for these types of villages. Um, and it's very different than other um, emerging arts communities in China, I think, in two key respects. Um, the first is it's to house contemporary art and architecture as opposed to traditional crafts. Um, and the second is that unlike 798 or a number of the communities that are like this in Asia that are installed in basically kind of leftover uh, industrial areas, this was a, the, the developer and the client really want this to be a tabula rasa, which was very evident to us a few months after, after our scheme was selected we went out to visit the site it became very clear that the only context that you could really argue for in this kind of project was the unit itself. Unfortunately, I don't think this project is going to get built. It was put on hold in 2008, but um, by the government, they took over the land and, I don't know, things over there work in serious ways. But um, Clover and I, you know, as any competition, I suppose, is for any of us, it was a great workout for us and something to stretch out on. Um, and what we really got into in this project was trying to figure out ways that we could play with the pro forma the client wanted, which was really to have the gallery, the studio, the living, and the garden on, on totally autonomous floors. So we're just kind of reworking that by the time we get to here. They're still on separate floors, but we're trying to orient um, things vertically and again get into this interplay of these two different kinds of mass uh, in 2020 hindsight, this is kind of a standard mirror. It's two-thirds impacted into this, um, this plinth, uh, which is just something I noticed when I was putting together this lecture. But there are lots of reversals here, and this is what I mean by trying to build up a dynamic. Instead of, the, instead of the plinth being opaque and the units being transparent, it's kind of the other way around in this. This is set within that. 
Uh, and we tried to network this vertically through the units by using the stairs, kind of pulling you in and out of this more opaque studio uh, mass and back into this much more transparent plan. The studio, I think, interestingly, becomes kind of schizophrenic uh, as a result of this. It has to deal with getting people up onto the roof, getting studio space on the floor, getting people into the gallery. Um, and what Clover and I really wanted to start playing with here is how it would start to take on different qualities as you're moving up under uh, and around it as you're moving through the unit. And this was, we started developing this using a series of bounding boxes, kind of looking at how edges shift between two dimensions and three dimensions and back. Part of this was to hand stuff off to the um, local architect, but for us it was a kind of perceptual study, how things could be shifting around, how different zones might transform as they move vertically. You can see this a little bit, this flash animation, kind of all coming together. But it's again this play between 2D and 3D, um, things moving in and out. The studio itself is, is, that mass is quite large, almost the same size, if you look at it at a per unit scale, as the same area in the plinth. And this was really to create a kind of friction or a tension, where this is uh, being lodged in there, but the idea was to think about it as an emitter, that it would kind of exfoliate, it would be close enough to the perimeter walls that it would produce different effects as you're moving around the unit. So when you're underneath it, for instance, you have these very hard edges. Uh, these begin to soften as you move vertically. Um, different distances determine whether or not these are kind of, we're using these corners to kind of join and simultaneously separate the mass to get these to congeal. Obviously, from the outside, the studio is very heavy and kind of suspended. That was part of the idea. And then it would almost reverse when you're in the studio um, working. It becomes very light very soft, um, still fairly isolated. None of these windows you're really looking out of, but the sensibility of it begins to shift, and we're kind of trying to press the light into the unit. Uh, out, the, the units and how they began to combine together was really important in this project because of the fact that it wasn't just about the studios, the artists producing work in their studios, but it, a lot of what they were looking for is how artists would interact or have exchanges with one another. So how these begin to come together, um, both on a programmatic and for us, on the level of different rhythms and cadences of massing, starts to become um, quite important. And this was something we played with, looking at kind of different patterns of vertical circulation and how the mass could congeal or dissipate. This was, the scheme that was selected for 28 of these units to be built. And I believe it's because of some of the differences going on in the roof versus when you're underneath it, where you get these much larger breakout spaces between studios versus more isolated ones uh, up here. And then you get areas underneath the studios where you kind of get a compound of studios operating right next to one another, which can open up into bigger kind of gallery spaces. We call this the great room. Each one of these um, aggregates had a different kind of gallery we spoke about. But within the context of mass production, part of what we're looking for here is for this to produce different cadences where the autonomy of these units disappears. It gives way to the corners and the way the glass works and kind of rips out of here. Uh, in some ways, we were using artificial light to kind of enhance some of those things. And at a larger scale, we were interested in how this would set up kind of differences between very smooth, taut surfaces, ones with some depth, and ones with much more depth as you're moving around this, and the way it might operate on the corners. Um, it is not unrelated to this project that we're doing in Hong Kong right now that's under construction. Um, this is a 4,000 square foot townhouse that we are working on, um, and Clover and I refer to this as an overture project, which, you know, in all honesty for us just means we're able to see how we can take small chunks of this and do kind of individual experiments, and we have a much looser idea of how it all uh, adds up into a bigger project. But um, it's unique in Hong Kong because it's very big. It's a townhouse. This is in a row of six others, and 4,000 square feet is a lot to work with. 
And part of that has to do with the fact that it started as one unit, and then kind of jokingly we told the client, you know, you should buy this unit next door and you bought it. Um, so it's the, it's the reverse of the GBD project in a sense. Our whole, a lot of our scheme here is how we can dismantle the aggregation of the separate units versus how we can put them together in terms of how we started to think about this. And I think we've been finding this more and more in residential projects that you'll get two kind of very different or schizophrenic floor plans um, where one space, in this case the Piano Noble, is kind of a totally open free plan and then upstairs um, and in the floor below, you get much more cut up um, partition spaces. And what we have been thinking about in this project is really how this, this floor in between can begin to become activated and really participate as a second kind of mass working its way into um, the upper and the lower floor here. Which we're doing by basically taking the edges of that mass and starting to push them up and down into those two zones. And we're queuing them up somewhat monolithically with the materials that are along those edges. So as the stone transitions to wood, this part of the mass kind of dives down and it's all wood. This is all stone. And the rib, um, uh, the rib ceiling pushes up into this lantern up to the second floor. Um, this is really the, the biggest of the three and has some interesting, um, interesting things going on in terms of how it shifts between two dimensions and three dimensions or becomes more three dimensional. It's constrained by this bounding box on the second floor in terms of how much we can work with it. And a lot of what we're studying is how we can just subtly pull it off of, just off of being a two dimensional graphic pattern. So as you move upward, it becomes more and more three dimensional. It kind of comes down towards you, leans over your head. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a lot of things that you lose when you're working in, in China, um, a lot of control that you lose over certain things, but there are things that you get that you, I think, are very difficult to find in other places. Uh, like you can do tons of mock-ups. Um, they really like learning that way on the site. So we're, th these are like two of four different mock-ups of that area where we're just looking at the cadence of these, whether the thinness of them is correct, how we're integrating artificial lighting with it, things of that nature. Um, the area where it is wood kind of punches down much more aggressively, so we've intentionally thickened this up. And the screening room underneath that kind of becomes monolithically uh, one material. How these all add up, uh, you know, I think we have a loose idea about this, but if nothing else, Clover and I have been trying to think about this operating on the oblique in, a, in both plan and section. So as you're moving up, each of these are tied to stairs, as you're moving up, around, and through um, the project, you're kind of constantly moving between, under, or around each of these areas. We are doing some uh, exterior work on this building. We have thickened up uh, the building enclosure on the second floor to kind of render that mass slightly heavier. And really examining some of what we can do with these windows where we're trying to get them to, in a way, respond to that ceiling pushing up into the second floor here, kind of tuck and push in. Which, um, these were some shots on a pretty foggy day on the site, but this is something that we're, we've tried to carefully calibrate so that it wouldn't just be apparent on the exterior but thicken and make the length of these sills long enough that you would see this kind of slip away, this edge kind of slip away or fold in. Um, this idea of thickening windows and openings is something that, that I'll talk a bit more about tonight, but um, it's something we've been exploring a bit further in this project called Butterfly House. Um, this is really our first project that we've taken an uh, aggressive step into working with color. Um, and thankfully, I can kind of parlay that responsibility to our clients who are artists and painters. But it has been very, very fun and interesting to work with them because the way they think about color has very little to do with the color itself and more to do with what the physical effects of the color are. Um, and some of the materials that we've chosen reflect this. But, the idea really has to do with how this color can be thrown off of the building and how it can shift 
or congeal in different ways. And I'll show you some of the uh, material we're using for this. But the way we started designing it was really thinking of these two a kind of thinner, more textured, colorful mass interlaced with a more blank, opaque, non-colored mass. Uh, the project is on a site. This is basically upstate New York. It's technically Pennsylvania, but they already have a summer home on here and two studios. And the house is really seen as an entertainment space that kind of lives between the woods and the pond. Um, it's very much how we have been uh, thinking about it and designing it. And part of that has to do with how this will throw color off into the foliage during different seasons and grab color from that, uh, from its context as it changes throughout them between uh, winter, summer, spring, and fall. The bounding box for this is something that we basically we constrained um, the project with. It was a matter of us just kind of wanting to work with the frame and look at how we could inflect it uh, slightly to get more three-dimensional effects. Uh, and part of that has to do with kind of being able to slip through the building uh, almost immediately, almost as if you could go through here and miss the building and activating these zones um, below these two canopies. Uh, it's a pretty standard, well, I guess somewhat standard entertainment space. I mean, there's very light amenities for sleeping, kitchen and stuff, but it, they really see this as a larger kind of um, party path. Um, for us, a lot of what we were doing was looking at how we could begin to um, activate this cladding and make it more three-dimensional. So you'll notice that it kind of pulls under uh, in different ways. And this is a matter of taking something which is very two-dimensional on one hand and beginning to thicken it and bend it around to make it much more three-dimensional. Part of which has to do with basically chucking the color back down onto the building. So the way these will throw blues back down onto the glass in the patio has a lot to do with how we're um, beginning to form those areas. Some of it's structural, of course, that's, it's a, basically a very simple wood truss that's just flipped over is how we're getting that shape. We've been working with a company in Chicago that treats stainless steel in a very similar manner to how you treat anodized uh, aluminum. Um, this was, you know, we really like to work with the materials we're designing for um, in the office, and we've pushed ourselves to try to find a standard kind of off-the-shelf material for this project. Uh, and we are mixing both some standard and yeah, custom colors um, for the project. But the, this is a mock-up we did at the studio just before I left. The thing that we find really fascinating about these is even within one panel, you don't get a stability of color. You can start to see magentas um, kind of hinting their way out at the edges of this. Uh, and when you get more direct light, for instance, you can really start to see how the blues start to impact these green panels. They kind of shift to a much more blue state. Butterfly House, I think, in, in many ways, is a kind of nice um, transition point to uh, talking about how we're thinking about mass media um, in the work. I think Clover and I believe architecture can absorb other media, um, can become a, a little bit quicker and blur. But the, we, we mean to be a little bit provocative by using this term um, and put two things together which you normally wouldn't associate. Mass, which in a kind of classic architectural sense is very heavy and opaque, it's very stable. And media, something which is very fluid, transitory, uh, ephemeral, or immaterial. And a lot of what we have been looking at, um, kind of going back to Rome, has to do with uh, how you work on openings um, in a building. For us, this is kind of the, the place where you get the most exchange of the ephemeral with mass, of light with mass. Um, and like this window, which is in the crypt of San Carlo alla Quattro Fontane, uh, what, what kind of fascinated us about this is it really has the ability to materialize the light. It starts to make it more three-dimensional. It's not just punched into the crypt that starts to actually begin to shape the light, which is one way that we like to think about massing things that might be a bit more ephemeral. 
Um, the other, which is the medium through which you might deliver some media. Um, the other part of it are other media, which you may not um, always uh, find, or non-architectural media that you may find um, in a building, and how they relate to those openings. So, uh, like this squinch, there are ways to use two-dimensional graphics and blur the boundaries between two and three dimensions that begin to, let's say, not create a transition that is soft, but develop a more robust mixture of two different things that are shifting. For us, what, what we think is important about this is there's an elus elusive shift between multiple dimensions and what is what. And that comes from the inclusion or ways of thinking about 2D media might be experimented with uh, in the work. The, probably the best example of how you combine this, at least something we got into pretty intensively while we were in Rome, is looking at some of Bernini's work. Um, and I'm not going to go into this in depth, but um, uh, San Andrea Alperinale is really probably the best example of one of the earliest of, of how architecture can begin to do this. But there are two things about this project that, that I find absolutely fascinating. One is you never see the windows in the building at all. You don't know where they are or how light comes into the building. You can just see the edge of this window here. And the secreting away of that cutout or opening gives you the effect that this vault is in some ways being almost pneumatically inflated by the light. And these kind of make, I mean, he does a relatively diligent job of distributing these openings on the exterior, but for all intents and purposes, they make no sense on the outside. Um, the other thing which is fascinating is how, uh, and I think, I hope it will help to point out what I mean by shifting dimensionalities. You start to get different dimensions acting upon each other, the virtual and the real, kind of um, crossing, moving across one another, where the light from this opening, it becomes unclear if that's the same light in the painting. The way bodies are postured moves across the frame. People are, you know, putti are looking at one another as you move around here. And so there's a very robust exchange, uh, I would say, between painting, sculpture, and architecture that begins to make ambiguous or throw things into different states of, dimen of dimensionality. Architecture may become more two-dimensional. Two-dimensional stuff may become more three-dimensional. And I think if you simplify the discussion in a contemporary context, it has a lot to do with how we as architects choose to include other media, which more often than not today is advertising graphics, for instance, or signage. And this is a, a debate that clearly goes a time to uh, Mr. Venturi. Um, but I would say even more so to artificial lighting, which is the, the primary purveyor um, of signage. And for us, I think Clover and I have a very difficult time believing that, that um, architecture can be absent of material. There is certainly one group of architects who work with media that believe that you can have pure media as architecture. We are always looking at ways that it, it takes on aspects of materiality, and I think part of this stems from some of the collaborations with graphic designers and with artists when I was doing work with Servo, where strangely, there was a, in, the interest of the collaboration was how they could materialize what was otherwise a fairly ephemeral media in which they were working. Um, and I think these projects, in some ways, there's a, a struggle that I've noticed retrospectively between uh, materializing the ephemeral or dematerializing what is otherwise substantial. And I think, in many ways, these were you know, again, if I kind of, there's a lot in these projects that I'm not going to go into, but one thing I'll bring into the lecture is that they have ideas about making light more effulgent, giving it other properties of material, or taking um, cinema, um, something that is four-dimensional, and looking at ways that it can literally become more three-dimensional. These are the kinds of, these are the kinds of shifts that, that I'm trying to suggest um, have something to do with mass media. Uh, indeed, these, these are lighting effects, and some might even say special effects, but um, I saw a lot of, and see a lot of architectural potential in them, and I'm not really going to go into this competition entry we did for the Taipei Pop Music Center, but going to use it to point out in the clearest way I can the, the bigger issue here, which is um, uh, 
how architects, and I think having a position on how you work with media is becoming increasingly more important. This competition, uh, Jesse and Nanako coincidentally won this, but it really is a, it's a very contemporary program, big pop music center in Taipei, and they were really asking for an architecture that's a media screen. Um, and so I think how one begins to deal with all of those LEDs, all of the artificial lighting, all of the content of the media, and think about it in ways that don't bump it out of the dis discourse or discipline of architecture, architecture is, it's important at least to Clover and I. Um, uh, which uh, I think is part of why when we began Lunar House, this 2,500 square foot speculatively home, why we invited um, an artist to join us, um, C.E.P. Reese, and to collaborate with us uh, on the project. Um, in an odd way, it seemed entirely logical to us at the moment, but in retrospect, I see it a bit as kind of forcing another media, uh, a two-dimensional software media into the project, a house. Um, but it's maybe not so strange when you think about it in terms of the specific way that we were using this, which um, is to really rethink the fresco in contemporary terms in which, in the kind of most primary way, what we were trying to do is flip the fresco to the exterior uh, of the building. Uh, of course, we were drawing upon, we were designing parts of this while we were at Rome. Um, and so we amplified or were drawing upon some of these historical relationships about the crossover between art, uh, painting, and sculpture. But what is really different, I think, for us about it is we've been working with Casey since the very beginning uh, of this project, and I'll show some of that work. So the ontology of it isn't that you either have one author doing the sculpture in the architecture, or that you define a zone in which this other medium sits, but it becomes part of the development of the project. Um, the basic diagnostics of the project are it's been designed to work with a, a 50 by 100 foot site with very standard setbacks. This is amongst the more uh, dense lot sizes that you'll find in the suburban U.S. Um, the cantilevers in it are part of what stems from our interest uh, in massing, but of course um, with Hometa, who is the developer we're working with on this, we are kind of finding other alibis for that, like casting shadow over earth berms for water retention, minimizing footprint, um, also questioning how you can site a project like this working it along its length instead of frontally. Probably the most unique aspect of it is the Decorian solid surface cladding. Um, this will be one of the first projects to use it in the States, definitely in a residential application. This is the same stuff that you're familiar with for countertops and sinks, uh, which is now being used on the outside of buildings. Um, what drew us to the, you know, we didn't really know or care how innovative that was to some extent. What drew us to the material was the, amb the amb ambiguousness of its quality, I think interestingly, sits between a lot of familiar uh, materials that we understand. Um, so to some extent, it's, it's, it's elusive aspects that drew us to it, but um, also it's translucency, which was important in terms of the effects, but also important in terms of the way we are citing this, because there is a need in this kind of density for artificial depths. So the fresco is doing some suburban work, uh, but then also work on the massing. Uh, the project actually launched with Marcelo and Georgina's exhibition, uh, Matters of Sensation, that they did at Artist Space that a number of us were involved with, excuse me, a year ago. And it began by developing a series of drawings, seven, to explore how we could design the house, um, what the diagrammatic relationship of it would be to the fresco, to the uh, line networks that we were developing with Reese. And this was, again, an idea about kind of putting two different kinds of mass together. It's a basic live work um, pro forma that we're inlaying it's inside of a larger, uh, inside of a larger mass. Looking at a number of issues, for instance, how um, edges begin to split, how in areas it can lock down and really become taut 
with the bounding box and in other areas, how that begins to um, relax, pucker. There are basically three states that the section experiences. Um, the areas which are the most cranked down to the bounding box or the most stable in some ways um, are the areas that are cantilevered, and then the areas which begin to deviate from the bounding box are the areas which are the most grounded. And there are two types of <coughs> cladding that we're working with. There's the Corian cladding, and then there is a basic storefront system, or right now it's actually a debate in the office whether or not that's going to be a storefront or a stucco system because of some of the issues with the project. But basically it orients itself in two different ways on the lower floor and the upper floor, kind of pushing uh, outward here and here. Essentially what we've been trying to do in this project, again, is marry these two otherwise distinct plan typologies. The ground floor is seen as a, as a studio, which can be converted into a bedroom, so this is a core, and all of this can be opened up into a larger studio format. The upper floor uh, is more cut up. The area that is cantilevered is kind of in a state in between. And I think, um, at least here in LA, I can point out something that at least excited me about this, is what we ended up with was a kind of classic um, ranch-style split-level valley kind of spin on that kind of a house that you would find here, where you end up with the living room and the dining room kind of on upper floors, but there are some weird flips where you find the kitchen up on the top and the office downstairs. In terms of working with uh, Reese, our, our early studies really explored how we could immure the fresco um, into the mass. So in, in many ways, how it would become something that is slightly detached from it, and nonetheless something that can't be fully detached from it. So it had to start doing work with the windows. Early on, we started thinking about how this might work with artificial lighting. Um, and to that extent, felt it prudent and somewhat necessary to build a large-scale model uh, of the project. This is about nine feet, about nine feet long. Um, and I think in many ways, and the, the skin of this model is actually Corian. Um, in many ways, a lot of the prototyping work that I have been doing with Servo carries over into my practice with Clover in the way that we make models. We use them on one hand to get our feet wet uh, and kind of scale down construction processes. But probably the most important way that we use them is to study effects that we find very difficult to study otherwise. Um, I would be the first to admit that this kind of an elevation wouldn't come from an architect who hasn't done a ton of renderings before. I mean, it's a very particular way of working with material that comes out of staring at the computer screen for years. Nonetheless, I don't think that um, you can render or, or study these kinds of subtleties very easily. Or at least for me, this is a handicap that I have. So looking at it in the model, um, using the lighting, allows us to look at how this white on white, planar to 2D to 3D, how a lot of these shifts might begin to manifest themselves in other scales. Um, certainly there are, are ways that we are pulling systems apart to relate to one another, how the windows are distributed and relate to the mass, and in fact how they're conceived more as things that press in than really punch openings. So they, they still have some degree of mass to them, at least in our minds, kind of pulling the fresco just barely to the interior. Uh, another part of this is working with um, Casey's beautiful, you know, these beautiful algorithms that he develops and trying to figure out ways that we could develop them more architecturally in relationship to the mass how they might be distributed, um, heightened, or dissipate. And this has been an evolving project. Casey updates this software for us every couple of months as we continue to do different projects with it. But it's, again, it's a piece of art as a platform, which I find somewhat provocative. And it starts as something completely virtual, uh, and what I understand is somewhat two and four dimensional. And then a lot of the work that we have to do is is look at how that becomes more three-dimensional. And this is really a theme that pulls through this project at large, 
where lots of it is really two-dimensional, but we're trying to give it a more three-dimensional set of effects. In fact, most of the Corian panelization is flat. It's only a very limited area of it that's more three-dimensional. I'm not going to show too much of this, because I'd love it if all of you will come to our um, exhibition, which is June 4th, I believe, is the opening for it. So I'm going to just try to show you some carefully selected photographs of the prototypes that we have been building for this house at full scale. Um, uh, we have been, you know, our main focus has been looking at how these dimensions shift for Clover and I, uh, and how we can get them to mirror and manifest in different ways. And we've been looking at it in two different materials. Uh, one is the corium, and we've decided, since we started working with the corium, to start looking at this using, as well, using a concrete, glass fiber reinforced concrete. And we have been collaborating now with DuPont for two years, and just started collaborating with this other company in Shanghai uh, this year. Both of which is to kind of streamline the process, you know, some much more traditional ideas about mass production start manifesting themselves uh, here. And you can see, um, you know, there are obvious ways that we have to start systematizing this. You want the panels to be as big as possible, uh, etc. But I think what drew DuPont to us, what was interesting to them, and why we've been able to form a collaboration with them, I think in part is because of there is a, a lot some of these techniques they have used um, autonomously on their own, these two-dimensional and three-dimensional techniques, but they've never been kind of put together all at once in one time and at one place. And that has been a lot of the work that we have done. And it's you know, a kind of hilarious mixture of high-tech and low-tech, uh, which in fact was, is not that different from the way that, that Clover and I and some UCLA students had to build this model. Um, but again, you know, the windows are totally flat, but they are, they're cut flat and then put together in a way to become more three-dimensional. Uh, and this is, you'll have to come to the exhibition to see the lighting, which is programmed, but there are other four-dimensional effects that begin to uh, work on these. And we've been looking at basically different ways that we can work with this fresco. Uh, the GFRC is quite a bit different, um, and we have tried to just exploit the material differences as much as we can. Um, there's no efficiency in the tooling for this material, because this particular factory, who basically was geared up by and for Zaha's um, Guangzhou Opera House, somehow Schumacher convinced them to make all of their molds out of wax, um, and like got them using various pieces of equipment. So they, they'll make infinite molds for you out of wax, and then they melt them down, and they make different ones. So there's no, really no cost in making multiple different molds. It's also a much more three-dimensional process. So these are, you're looking at the wax molds here. These are the same lines that we've been playing with in the Corian studies, um, but now you're seeing them manifest themselves in concrete, where they can pull off the surface in different ways, and we can interface them with the sills of these windows uh, in a number of different ways. The hinge project um, between, between uh, Lunar House and, and its prototypes is the storefront that we uh, recently finished in Hong Kong. Um, this project, you know, we, some, we somehow lucked out in convincing DuPont that they, because they wanted to learn more about these processes and didn't really understand what we were doing, we convinced them, they said we want to do some prototypes, and so we said, hey, well, you know, what about using our, our storefront that we just rented in Hong Kong? And so obviously it has advertising potential for them, but we feel very fortunate that they have let us use it. Um, it's called Yud Yud, which in Cantonese um, basically means a pucker-like smile. Um, if Sylvia were here tonight, I don't know if she's in the audience, I might suggest this is slightly kissing, but I don't think it's the same kind that she's, she's currently talking about. Um, so DuPont, in effect, became our client, and our studio became their site. Um, 
And it's set within an old, very quirky neighborhood uh, of Hong Kong. When Tom Main came out and visited us a few months ago, he said it reminded him a lot of Santa Monica. I mean, I'm sure Craig and Main talked about this, it, you know, like 15, 20 years ago. There's these weird fabrication shops, like these guys next door are building a CNC mill. And then there's fashion designers and a gallery. It's this kind of weird walking area um, of Wan Chai that's set within a sea of, of skyscrapers. Um, for Clover and I, it's our first really urban project. So the way that it the way that it fits into the neighborhood for us was really an opportunity um, and something we wanted to to um, think about as carefully as we could. And when we were talking about when we were beginning the project and we were talking about design, we kept coming back to this article that Theodore Adorno wrote um, uh, comparing Louis Armstrong with Van Morrison, which I think is, is pertinent because it, it has to do with the maturing of recorded music. And to me, this project, I hope in some ways, shows a kind of maturing of at least our involvement with these processes over the years. Um, Adorno basically talks about how Armstrong, who was an early pioneer into recorded music, his stuff is very extroverted. Like he really has to reach out because the audience then was much more used to live performance. So he has to reach out and kind of be full frontal to pull you into a recorded soundtrack. Whereas Van Morrison, who's working 20 years later, um, particularly if you listen to his stuff in the 60s or the 70s, you know he will like mumble and whisper into the microphone. You know, he was known for doing performances with his back turned to the audience, for instance. So there is a, a, a very different way, which Dorno calls a much more introverted. It's about pulling you in um, versus reaching out and grabbing you. Um, and I think the subtlety, the kind of white on white, how it shifts between high and low contrast between dimensions um, of this project is, is definitely more about that kind of Van, Van Morrison approach, where you can't totally hear it um, or see uh, precisely what's going on. Um, in fact, we've often found strangers coming up to this and, and rubbing it, um, which is a little bit awkward. Um, but, you know, we find it actually wonderful because it means they can't actually look at it and see it. There's some willfulness to have to go touch it. Um, we developed the storefront in a very similar manner to Looter House, um, using the platform that Reese had set up for us. Uh, and we had the opportunity to deal with a number of tests. This shows you a little bit more clearly how we're driving the end mill into um, 12 mil of material. Basically, the etching here is even three-dimensional, so it's a kind of subtle play on what's what. But these lines are the same as these have very different appearances. And the kind of low resolution quality of this then gets heightened when you begin to introduce lighting. And when that lighting is programmed, you get even more kind of shifts between dimensions, which I'll show a little film of at the end of this. For Corey and the, you know, the kind of mystery to them, and, and I think to all of us, is really how to get around this edge. <clears throat> These panels are formed separately. They're milled flat. Clover and I, it really has to do with how this can flatten itself out at moments. How by only using a limited amount of light, it turns into something which is more graphic at moments. And in different kinds of light, where it's more white on white, it pops a bit more three-dimensional. This is probably the most exacerbated when the doors are open, as they are in this case. Um, you know, this was, it was a quite unique opportunity to work with them. We were basically able to use the studio as a kind of research lab, um, working with DuPont and beginning to, to simulate the construction process that will occur when we build, uh, when somebody in the audience orders uh, a lunar house and we get to build it somewhere in the world. Um, and it, a lot of this had to do with systematizing how the steel would work and the cladding and a number of other things. I show you some of these images because I, what I find interesting about the project is it's innovative and maybe in some small ways, but it's very normative in some other ways. And it is really um, the mixture of these things that, that are uh, the kind of high tech and the low tech um, attributes of it that get sandwiched into this 
area here uh, of the door. Um, and I think, really for us, it's a way of, part of what we'd like to do with artificial light is use it in different ways. And so, of course, in, in Asia, and, and I think you see this certainly in Las Vegas and to some extent in LA, you know, when you have signs and there is lighting in it, you're usually showing off the lighting. Um, and a lot of what we're trying to do is actually pump it through material, almost to the point that you don't see it, uh, concealing it behind it, which um, produces some more uh, mysterious uh, effects. Oh, it's playing up there. Okay. Yeah, you'll see it in a second here. But, um, I'm just going to end with this movie. This is a stop-action movie that a, a, a film artist did in Hong Kong. Here you can see the lights. It's no longer stop-action. You're actually seeing a bit of a little work. Um, but I'd simply like to end by saying that Clover and I feel it's important as designers to really amass um, as much as we have at our disposal. And for us, this has been taking a hard look at how things can vary from coarse to smooth, from high contrast to low, 2D to 4D. Um, so it's, in a way, not just one or the other, but it's this oscillating or the mirroring um, that is really important to us. And I suppose one could see this as a signal or a sign of us coming to terms with the realities of our practice. Um, but we firmly believe that this is fairly rich um, theoretical territory and, and has some broader implications um, um, for architecture, which um, you know, maybe maybe we've begun to tap into a little bit. So, thanks for coming down to take a look at what we.